friends, welcome again to Sabbath School Study Hour here at the Granite Bay Seventh-day Adventist Church in Sacramento, California. We'd like to welcome our online members, and I know there are a number of other folks joining us across the country and around the world, part of our extended Sabbath School class. We'd also like to welcome our regular members and visitors who are joining us here in person this morning. And even though we are in California, it feels a little bit more like Oregon this morning, doesn't it, with all the rain? We're glad you braved the rain and are here to study with us. Through the last few weeks, we've been studying through the book of Revelation. And that's been our Sabbath school quarterly. And today we're nearing the end of our study together. We're actually on lesson number 12. So we have one more lesson left on the book of Revelation. Today's lesson is entitled Judgment on Babylon. We're looking in Revelation chapter 17 is the principal passage that we'll be studying uh, we do have a free offer for those who are joining us online. If you'd like to learn more about these important prophetic themes, our free offer today is an Amazing Facts Study Guide. It's entitled The USA in Bible Prophecy. And this is our free offer. All you'll need to do is call the number 866-788-3966 and ask for the offer 181. And we'll be happy to send this to anybody who calls and asks. And you'll be able to learn more as you study this free offer. If you'd like to receive a digital download of the study, you'll need to uh, text the following code SH093 to the number 40544. And you'll be able to download the study guide, the U.S. in Bible Prophecy. Well, before we get to our study this morning, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Dear Father, once again, we are grateful that we have this opportunity to open up your word and study the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, and in particular, a very important subject relevant for the time in which we are now living. And so, Father, we ask for your Holy Spirit to come and guide our hearts and lead us into a clearer understanding of these important truths, for we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you've been following our Sabbath School study hour, uh, we've been studying the book of Revelation over the past few weeks, you've noticed from time to time, Pastor Doug Batchelor and myself, we've been sort of tag teaching some of the lessons. And we've been having a good time. I know Revelation is a favorite book of Pastor Doug. It happens to be one of my favorites as well. And so this morning, we're going to try to do that again, Pastor Doug. We will, and this, this is not scripted. So um, Pastor Ross is going to jump in. He'll, he'll give me some kind of signal. And, uh, we're, but we're going to go through this very important presentation. And uh, if you've not heard the study on Revelation 17, uh, I suggest you have a little prayer <laughs> and you ask God to give you grace to understand this. I know when some people first hear this, it uh, kind of knocks their socks off. So um, we're going to start with a memory verse. And the, the lesson, of course, for today, we're dealing with the judgment on Babylon. And we have a memory verse. It's from Revelation 18, 4 and 5. And we invite you to say that with me. This is from the New King James Version. Are you ready? And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive of her plagues. For her sins have reached to heaven and God has remembered her iniquities. Several times it says, come out of her, her sins, her iniquities. What does a woman represent in prophecy? A church. And uh, so uh, a good, pure, bright woman represents the church of God, Revelation 12. This is the antithesis of that. Revelation 17, evangelists call this the sermon on the scarlet harlot. Uh, and uh, she is drunken with blood. It's not a pretty picture. Abominations and plagues. And, and this is talking about a church that became unfaithful as a bride who cheats on her husband. You find that story appearing many times in the Old Testament, the book of Hosea. It talks about how God's people have played the harlot. They were his wife and they ran off with pagan lovers. This happened to, to the church not too long after the time of the apostles. And so uh, we're going to delve into this and we'll be going from the screen. The first section in the lesson here, it's called the Harlot Babylon. And I, you know what I'd like to do, Pastor Ross, is I'm just going to read, tell you what, I'll read verses 1 through, why don't you do it? You want to read, you got your Bible open? Why don't you read verses 1 through, se Revelation 17, 1 through 6. This will set the stage for what we're going to study in the next few verses. 
you have your Bibles, Revelation chapter 17, beginning in verse 1, it says, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked to me, saying, Come, and I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. All right, John is shocked by this scene, and he's marveling. Uh, this woman is a persecuting power. She's drunk with the blood of the saints. Um, and if you want to find out right away where this woman is, the last verse in the chapter says, the woman that you saw is that great city, and that's verse 17, I believe, that reigns over, verse 18, the woman that you saw is that great city that reigns over the kings of the earth. All right, so what great city was reigning over the kings of the earth when John wrote Revelation? Rome. And so here, here you have a woman, uh, and what does a woman represent? A church. In what city? Rome. Right there, you can figure out what this is talking about. And most of the great Protestant reformers were in total agreement that Babylon represented this woman. Now, before we delve into that, let's just give you a little background so that we can understand what we're talking about. Babel, Babylon, appears way back there in, in uh, Genesis 11 when they built the Tower of Babel. And it was something that it was man-made salvation. Going to build a tower to save ourselves in cases of flood. Can't trust the Word of God don't want to be scattered, let us make a name for ourselves about making a name for ourselves, saving ourselves, work our way to heaven. And so Babel and Babylon sort of became, the word Babel means gate of God, Babel. But it later became known as Babylon because of the tongues were confused there as well. So it's one of those words that's got um, two histories. Now when you read about Babylon in Revelation, um, Keep in mind that these are Old Testament prophecies coming to life. I just pulled one here from Jeremiah 51, verse 6 through 8. Flee from the midst of Babylon, and every one of you save his life. Do not be cut off for her in her iniquity. There's a flee, it says in Revelation, from her plagues. For this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. He shall recompense her. Babylon was a golden cup. We just read about a golden cup. In the Lord's hands that made all the earth drunk. It says she drunk it with the blood of the saints. The nations drink her wine. We just read about wine. Therefore the nations are deranged. It says the nations were drunk. Babylon has suddenly fallen. We read about Babylon fallen in the second angel's message in Revelation 18. So all you're reading in Revelation is drawn from the prophecies of Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel that talk about Babylon and the fall of Babylon. So the better you're acquainted with those Old Testament prophets, Revelation is like a kaleidoscope of those different prophecies. You know, Pastor Doug, it's interesting to note in the Old Testament, you have, some have referred to it as the tale of two cities. Two cities standing in opposition one to the other. Both of them have to do with worship. You have Babylon, as mentioned, representing false worship. And then you have Jerusalem, which is a symbol of true mm -hmm. worship. And throughout Old Testament, you see these two cities at times Babylon conquers Jerusalem, at other times the people come out of Babylon back to Jerusalem. And so this back and forth between Jerusalem and Babylon. In Revelation we have two women. In Revelation 12 is a pure woman representing the true church being persecuted by this false church that we read about in Revelation chapter 17. So the parallels are rather interesting that we find both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. It's interesting to note that the church power in Revelation 17 is called Babylon and we go to the Old Testament we have a city called Babylon that was persecuting God's people. That's right. Amen. All right. We, we got a lot to cover. Now what mother-daughter teams persecuted God's people in the Bible? Now follow me. 
We just read about Babylon, the mother of harlots. I mean, she has daughters. So you got in Revelation 17, a mother and her daughters. Do you remember reading in the Old Testament about someone named Jezebel who persecuted the prophets of the Lord during a three and a half year period? You know how long three and a half years is in Hebrew calendar? 1,260 days. Remember, there was a famine for three and a half years, and then Elijah prayed that it wouldn't rain, then he prayed it would rain. She had a daughter named Athaliah who killed all the royal seed of David. Uh, so you got Jezebel and Athaliah. And um, three and a half years of famine. Elijah's fleeing. He's in the wilderness. Then you go to the New Testament. Oh, and here's where it talks where, where Athaliah saw her son was dead. She destroyed all the royal seed. She was a persecuting power as well. You go to the New Testament. You've got someone who came in the spirit and power of Elijah. What was his name? John the Baptist. During the three and a half year ministry of Jesus, Jesus preached for 1,260 days. There was another mother-daughter mother team. You got Herodias and her daughter danced. So that what? John the Baptist lost his head. Now people often ask me, uh, is there anything wrong with dancing? I say, well, it depends on what kind of dancing. The wrong kind of dancing, you can lose your head. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, here you've got that. Then you get to Revelation. You've got Babylon and her daughters. And there's a 1,260 year period where the people flee into the wilderness and they're persecuted. You see, you have, this is a pattern that is playing out through history prophetically. Any thoughts on that? Yes, it's also interesting to note that in the examples that Pastor Doug gave, in the case of John the Baptist, you have Herodias working through her daughter to influence the King Herod to persecute the prophet. So in Revelation, you have the mother church called Babylon, but she works through her daughters and eventually persecutes God's people in the last days. So there's that parallel once again between these Old Testament types relating to prophetic things. Yeah, you've got apostate Protestantism uh, that will influence apostate Catholicism to persecute the faithful and during that time period. All right, and now the next section, uh, the harlot riding the beast. Uh, how does God symbolize Babylon in Revelation 17? We're using some question answer programs. Frankly, we commingled our evangelistic slides to make it match up with the uh, Sabbath school lesson. Revelation 17, 18, and the woman that you saw is that great city that reigns over the kings of the earth. Now, just so you know that even in Christ's time, they looked upon Rome as spiritual Babylon. If you look in the um, uh, first letter of Peter, 1 Peter chapter 5, when he concludes his letter, he says, she who is in Babylon, elect together with you, greets you. What do you mean she who is in Babylon? The church? There were some Christians that were in Rome. He's not talking about Babylon. There's nothing going on there. They're talking about Christians that were in Rome. They called it Babylon even back then. They understood the spiritual analogy of that. Now this is review. A couple of weeks ago we talked about the mark of the beast and we said we want to make sure you understand what was the view of the reformers regarding uh, Babylon and who was this woman universally they believed it was the papacy or what we would call the Catholic Church. Now we're not trying to say anything. People are going to say that's hate speech. You're bashing the Catholic Church. Uh, some of the finest Christians in the world are in the Catholic Church. They do a lot of great things. We're talking about a system of organization that became unfaithful to the scriptures. That's what we're dealing with. And uh, this is, uh, keep in mind, the quotes we're going to quote, maybe you can read this one, Pastor Ross. And this is John Wycliffe, a Catholic priest. Listen to what he said. He said, we suppose that the Antichrist, the head of all these evil men, is the Pope of Rome. Here's another one by another Catholic priest. Go says, ahead. the Pope is the true Antichrist of whom it is written that he sits in the temple of God amongst the people where Christ is worshipped. The vicar is in the place of the absent chief that is such a vicar but Antichrist. I know and am certain that the papacy is the kingdom of Babylon. All right, now the former one I read was John Huss or that we held up there. This one, of course, is Martin Luther. All three of these were Catholic priests. Through the study of Scripture, they said, we have become that unfaithful woman in Revelation 17. They protested it. That's why they get the name Protestants. Uh, here's one, John Knox also, he, had, he was a Catholic priest until he was evicted or excommunicated. 
Yea, we do not doubt to prove the kingdom of the Pope to be the kingdom and power of Antichrist. And here's one you want to read, John Wesley. John Wesley said, He it is that exalted himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, claiming the highest power and the highest honor, claiming the prerogatives which belong to God alone. And um, then here's one by Charles Spurgeon. You want to read that? He says, Bold, Behold, upon her forehead is the name Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, the abomination of the earth, the church of Rome and her teachings are the vast mountain of rubbish covering the truth of God. So you don't have to wonder how Spurgeon felt. <laughs> but this is what all of the Protestants used to preach. You don't hear it very much anymore, do you? Mm -hmm. They said, you know, we're, we're drifting from Scripture. This is what happened to the church. And um, I think and this is from a book. I'll read this one. This is a, just a book called The Cloud of Witnesses. Wycliffe, Tyndale, Luther, Calvin, Kramer in the 17th century, Bunyan, John Bunyan who wrote Pilgrim's Progress, the translators of the King James Bible, the men who published the Westminster and Baptist Confessions of Faith, Sir Isaac Newton, John Wesley, George Whitfield, Jonathan Edwards, and more recently Spurgeon, Bishop J.C. Ryrie, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, these among countless others all saw the office of the papacy as the Antichrist. They all read Revelation 17 and said, if there is a slam dunk prophecy in the Bible, this is it. You can't confuse it. Now, let's, with that background, let's go on to our next question here. What other evidence from Revelation 17 proves that Babylon refers to papal Rome? Well, now we're going to go through a list of criteria. And uh, Pastor Austin, I'll take turns. I'll go to A and you can do B. One, she's guilty of blasphemy. Blasphemy means when you either claim the right to forgive sin, they accuse Jesus of blasphemy when he said he could forgive sin, they claim that, or blasphemy is when you put yourself in the position of God. They accuse Jesus of blasphemy when he said that he was God. I am that I am. Here's B. Oh, the, here's some of the quotes, sorry. Pope is of so great a dignity and so exalted that he's not a mere man, but as it were God and the vicar of God. That would be technically a definition of blasphemy. Point number B, it says she is dressed in purple and scarlet. It's interesting, the colors that, colors that are specifically mentioned, they were colors of royalty back in Bible times. But if you look at some of the official colors of the, uh, the papacy, it's pretty clear that purple and scarlet play prominent roles. Are you the cardinal, what color is a cardinal bird? It's red. So the cardinals always wear red, the bishops wear purple. And, and, you know, in fairness, we should say that in the priest, in the temple, the priest in God's temple, there was also scarlet and purple. But here it's talking about an unfaithful church is also using scarlet and purple. Go ahead. It says she's adorned with gold, precious stones, and pearls. Very wealthy church, as I think we all know. Yeah, I think the uh, Catholic Church is the l largest private owner of uh, rare and precious gems in the world. And owns, I think they own the uh, largest private owner of silver, not gold, but of silver, too. Um, she's called the Mother. Now, it's interesting. Do you know the Pope? Why well, he's the head of the Catholic Church. He's also the pastor of a specific congregation. It's a church in Rome. It's called the uh, Lateran Church. And here is a plaque that you find today that is in marble on the Lateran Church in Rome where the post Pope is the pastor. Uh, it's like, you know, um, you know I, I direct Amazing Facts, but I also pastor a church. Well, the Pope is the head of the Catholic Church, but he also has a congregation. This is the church, and it says here, this is the Latin translation, the sacred Lateran mother and head of all churches of the city and the world. So they claim the title mother. All right, here's the next one. Point number D, it says she has harlot daughters who also are fallen. Revelation chapter 14, it says, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. And she's said to be the mother of harlots. So if a woman represents a church, that which would constitute her daughters would be those churches that are holding to the teachings and the doctrines of the mother church. And so we're talking not only about uh, the papal power, but we're also talking about those Protestant churches that are holding to the same doctrines and teachings that originate from the mother church and are not found in the Bible. Yeah, if you have a, uh, a daughter is going to usually resemble her mother, maybe not completely because the father hopefully had some influence, uh, but in the same way the Protestant churches, though they came out and tried to come back to the Bible, they still 
as one pastor put it, they still had in their bosom relics of popery. They still clung to a lot of those foundational teachings. It says that she's a persecuting power and martyred the saints. We read in verse uh, 6 it said that she's drunken with the blood of the saints. And so um, the Catholic Church freely admits that they persecuted. And during the period of the Dark Ages, especially during the Spanish Inquisition, estimates range anywhere from 20 to 50 million Christians and Jews or anyone branded a heretic was killed by the church, burned at the stake, buried alive, drowned, you name it. And uh, it's just, it's a shocking history. Uh, Karen and I were in Spain last year and we were in a little gift shop and we saw in the back of the gift shop it said, you want to see the torture room? And I said, well, how much to see the torture room? <laughs> <laughs> it was like $2 or whatever. And so he said, sure, we'll go look at the torture chamber. And so they took us down and they showed us under all the churches all around Toledo, Spain, and uh, different cities, they got these places and they got the implements where they tortured uh, Christians who did not comply or they called them heretics. And it was, oh, it was frightening. You want to read that? Yes, from the book History of the Popes, it says, Great numbers were driven from their habitations with their wives and children, stripped and naked, many of them inhumanely massacred. All right, it says she rules over the kings of the earth. And what's meant by that, this, any of you ever play chess? If you know, if you play chess, uh, that to the right of the king and queen, a game that was developed during the Dark Ages, you always had the bishop, two bishops, one king, one queen, two bishops, to the right and to the left, because that's the way things were all throughout Europe. They had to sort of check with the church regarding any activity. They, the priests, and bishops were the counselors of the monarchies and they had great power and the church still has great power today. This is just one picture I threw in of, of Pope Francis who is negotiating peace between the uh, uh, president of Israel and the Palestinians. I think we all know that Pope Francis inserted himself in helping to uh, open things up for Cuba. Maybe you've heard in the news recently the Pope offered to mediate between the two presidents that are fighting in Venezuela right now. Did you catch that piece of news? And so it's not just a religious figure. It is a political figure that has influence over the kings of the earth. Go ahead. Yes, the next point that we have is identification of the scarlet beast. All right, so how do these beasts of Revelation 12, 13, and 17 compare? So now we're talking about, we talked about the woman. Now it says the woman's riding a beast. Now typically the one riding is in control. If you've ever ridden a horse and you're not in control, I'm sure you remember that. <laughs> Any of you ever have some of those experiences where the horse thought he was in control? <laughs> Are you waiting for your hand to go up, Vicky? <laughs> but um, yeah, so typically that means that they're the ones that are in power. And um, there's some similarities that you find when you look at Revelation 12, 13, and 17. We're going to look at those verses now. First of all, Revelation 12, you can read that for us. It says, And there appeared another one in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having, here's the point you want to note, seven heads, ten horns, seven crowns upon its head. Now when you go to Revelation 13, next chapter, you can read that. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon its heads the names of blasphemy. So there's some similarity. Now before we go to the third beast, you know in uh, Daniel chapter 7, Daniel's given this vision of the future and, and beasts are used. And a lion represents what kingdom? Babylon. And a bear? Medo-Persia. And a leopard? Greece. And then there's this fourth beast that it can't find a word for, it just tells its characteristics, but it's not like anything we know now. It's the exceeding dreadful fierce. So you got uh, a lion, uh, a bear, and a leopard. Now when you go to Revelation 13, it says this beast comes up out of the sea, and it says that he's like a leopard, a bear, and a lion. <laughs> in, Revel in Daniel, it's lion, leopard, bear. In Revelation, it's leopard, bear, lion. Why? Daniel has this vision. He's looking forward to these kingdoms. John now has this vision, those kingdoms of uh, Greece, Persia and Babylon are backwards. So the perspective is exactly as it would be in history. So this second beast in Revelation, or the first beast in Revelation 13 that comes up, right away you see it's a composite of these former kingdoms. And I should pause here and, and just mention that, uh, and you just interrupt me if you get a thought. I should pause here and just mention that 
what's happened is through history when Persia conquered Babylon, Persia embraced some of the things they learned from the ba Babylonians and kept it. When the uh, Greeks conquered the Persians, uh, Alexander the Great and the Greeks, they kept certain things that the Persians had learned that worked well and they got stronger for it. And you know, each of these kingdoms reigns longer than the one before it. And then when the Romans conquered the Greeks, we all know, they call it Greco-Roman because the Romans adopted many things from the Greek government which was very good. They adopted Greek architecture, they adopted Greek learning, but they developed some new things that made them stronger. Their military was stronger. It's like the vision in Daniel of the statue. The top metal is the most precious but it's soft. Gold is softer than silver. Silver is less valuable but it's more valuable than bronze which is more valuable than iron which is more valuable than clay each one of these goes down in value but they go up in durability as far as hardness. Each kingdom lasts longer than the one before because it's learned. So they're all building on each other. That's why this beast you finally get to at the end of time, it's learned from all these empires that persecuted God's people and it's become stronger through it. Just to add to that Daniel 2 image, you've got the image head of gold, chest and arms of silver. You've got two arms representing the Medes and the Persians belly and thighs of brass representing Greece and then you got the legs of iron. It's interesting that two legs and two arms, the two arms are two parts of the empire, the, Pers the Persians and the Medes and then when it gets to the legs we recognize that the Roman Empire also consisted of two parts. You have pagan Rome and then pagan Rome eventually moves into what we call papal Rome. The pagan Rome ruled longer than any of the former kingdoms in Daniel 2 in the image but we find papal Rome ruling even longer than pagan Rome. So again these patterns are established that we see in the Old Testament now in the book of Revelation. Yep. All right and so now when we get to Revelation 13 we saw it in Revelation 12, we're talking about the beast again, saw it in Revelation 13, Revelation 17, it says I saw a woman on a beast, seven heads ten horns. Now who is the beast? Well we know in Revelation 12 the devil was working through the Roman power to kill the babies. That's what it said. Trying to devour the man child as soon as it was born. It was Roman soldiers that went to Bethlehem to kill the babies. It was Rome that crucified Jesus. It was Rome that killed Paul and Peter. So Rome was that power. Rome imprisoned John. But the devil is working behind the scenes through this power. And so it's, uh, it's a woman sitting on the Roman power. You'll notice it says that this beast receives its power, seat, and great authority from the dragon. And so ultimately when the woman comes into power she gets her power, seat and authority from the Roman power. They move the capital to Constantinople. They tell the Bishop of Rome you're large and in charge and uh, all of it fits so perfectly. You know what's interesting is a beast in Bible prophecy clearly represents a political power. A woman represents a church. Revelation 17 describes a union of church and state but it's interesting that the woman, the church, is directing the state. Well that's exactly what history tells us occurred during the Dark Ages or the Middle Ages. You had the church controlling the states, not just one power but all the powers of Western Europe. The church was dictating the kings and the different battles that were to be fought so you find the woman riding the beast in Revelation 17. All right, amen. What is the meaning and origin of the word Babylon? You read in Genesis 11, 4, 6, 7, and 9, Let us build a city and a tower whose top may reach into heaven. And the Lord said, Let us go down there and confound or confuse their language, their tongue. Babylon became a symbol of confusion. And this is what happened to the church during the Dark Ages. There was a lot of confusion in its doctrines. That they may not understand one another's speech, therefore the name of it is called Babel, because there the Lord did confound or confuse the languages of all the earth. Number six, how does God describe Babylon urging his people to leave? You want to read that one? Revelation chapter 18 says, verse 2, And he cried mightily with a strong voice, this is an angel coming down from heaven, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, the whole of every foul spirit. And then the next verse says, And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that he be not partakers of his sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. Interesting to note that God has got faithful people in this power, described as Babylon. In the last days, Jesus is calling his people to come out of religious confusion, 
to make their stand upon the truths of God's word. So come out of her, my people is the call in Revelation 18. And this happens all the way through the Bible. When it talks about Babylon, it meant the lands beyond the river, Mesopotamia. Where does God call Abraham? The people turn to idols. He calls them out of Ur, of the Chaldees. The Babylonians were called the Chaldeans. Brings them to the promised land. Then a wife for Isaac is called out of Mesopotamia, like a, a church, a bride, into the promised land. Jacob go get, goes to get his wife. He crosses Euphrates again, gets four wives. They were on sale. And he brought them back to the promised land. Then God's people are carried into Babylon during the time of um, Jeremiah. Seventy years there. Then they're called out. But you know, they didn't want to all come out. They'd been there 70 years. They were comfortable. You read the book of Ezra. And when he found out how few were willing to come, he says, we don't even have enough priests to man the temple. And he issued another appeal. Please come back to the promised land while the doors are open. And they said that there would be persecution that would happen to God's people who stayed in Babylon. After they got out of Babylon and they were allowed to rebuild the temple, a new king came to Persia that restricted the religious freedom in Babylon and they suffered for that. And during the time of Esther, there was a decree that was going to annihilate all the Jews that had stayed behind. So he said, get out of Babylon. It's going to be tough for those that stay behind. So there's a theme in Revelation that you see that's going on. All right, let's see what we got going next. Babylon is guilty of making the world drunk with her wine. What is the wine? Now we're going to go through, how do you know you're in Babylon? <laughs> how do you know if you're in a church that's in Babylon? What are some of the characteristics? And maybe you want to help me read some of these. Revelation chapter 17, 4 says, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations. Now again, wine in the Bible, just to give you an idea of what the symbol represents. Pure wine or unfermented wine, we refer to that today as grape juice, would represent Christ's sacrifice and Christ's teaching, which are true, trustworthy. Fermented wine or alcoholic wine represents false teaching or false doctrine, a counterfeit of the genuine. So here in Revelation chapter 17, this is a counterfeit wine because all nations are made drunk with the wine. So what are these false teachings that the Bible is describing in Revelation 17? Mm -hmm. Now Jesus said, uh, you you put new wine, speaking of his gospel, in new wineskins. Said uh, the old wineskins represented the false teachings and traditions that had crept into Judaism. So even Christ compared his teachings to new wine. Something, just a footnote here: the chalice, the golden cup, is the most important of the sacred vessels. And this woman who is holding that, it's you know the Protestant Reformation had a big battle over something called transubstantiation that the priest claimed he had the power to actually turn the wine, which was fermented, into the blood of Christ. And the reformer said, no, you don't have that power. You cannot create God. It's just a symbol of his blood. So that was a big battle. Another, well, how do you know whether or not these teachings are, are part of wine? Number one, the Ten Commandments are not binding. So any church or entity that says, you know, the Ten Commandments, they nailed to the cross, they're done away with, you don't have to keep God's Ten Commandments, well, that's a sign right there. There's something wrong. Yeah, sin is a transgression of the law. If you're in a church that said you don't need to keep the Ten Commandments, that God spoke with His voice and wrote with His finger, uh, you're in Babylon. And then another one would be Sunday sacredness. That would be connected with the um, uh, doing away with the Ten Commandments. If a person is saying, well, not only do you not need to keep the Sabbath, but now Sunday is a new holy day. And I always like to come back and say, show me one verse in the Bible that says Sunday is the new Sabbath. There's not one. So yet there are millions of Christians around the world that are led to believe that somehow we're supposed to keep Sunday holy. And I say, show me that commandment. All they have is tradition. I say, well, he rose on the first day. I said, that's true, but where does it say that's the new Sabbath? He died on Friday. Does that make it the new Sabbath? The Lord's Supper was on Thursday. Does that make it the new Sabbath? So God never changed the seventh-day Sabbath. Point number C is a teaching of a secret rapture, which we find popular not only amongst um, Protestant churches, or many of them, but also amongst certain Catholic groups. They are teaching a secret rapture. And of course, the second coming, if you read about it in the Bible, uh, the rapture does not take place or the catching away until Jesus comes again and there's a great earthquake and the graves are open and there is a resurrection. The wicked are destroyed at the brightness of Christ's coming. There's nothing secret about the second coming of Jesus. 
Matter of fact, the Bible says it's as the sound of a trumpet as lightning flashing from the east to the west. It's a glorious event when Jesus comes, not a secret rapture, as we hear many say. Every eye will see him. It's going to be a, a roar. The cities are broken down, uh, the most visible climatic event. Um, if you're in a church that's teaching the immortality of the soul, nowhere in the Bible does it say that you have an immortal soul. It says that when Christ comes, then this mortal will put on immortality. The Bible says God and God only, speaking of in our world, has immortality. So the Bible actually teaches the sinner will die. The wages for sin is what? Death. God said to Adam and Eve, you will surely die. The devil said you will not surely die. Sad thing is many pastors are teaching what the devil said to Eve in the Garden of Eden. So if you're in a church that's teaching that you have an immortal soul, that you are God, that's not what the Bible teaches. Point number E is uh, an eternal burning hell. Now the Bible is clear that there is a hell, a destruction of the wicked. You can read about that in Revelation chapter 20 and some other places throughout the scriptures. But the purpose of hellfire is to consume the wicked and purify the earth. The fires of hell do not burn without end. And that's the confusion. There is a teaching which crept in from paganism that there is an eternal burning place even now and the souls of the wicked are burning in this place of torment that has no end. Uh, many have been turned away from God thinking if that is what God is like, if that is what a God of love is like, I don't want anything to do with him. This idea of eternal torment in a place. That's really not what the Bible teaches on the subject. Yeah, not only do some turn away, many people go to church not because they love God but they're just afraid of hell and they're just driven by fear all the time. And so it's what you would call in the Bible a doctrine of devils that was used by the church to manipulate people. Now there are a few difficult verses that uh, have been taken to teach this, but there's a lot more in the Bible that says the wicked shall be consumed, they'll perish, they're burnt up, never will they be anymore, there's no more pain, all things are made new, they're devoured. I mean, you read the whole panoply of verses on the punishment of the wicked, it's very clear. Oh, one more thing on that, Pastor yeah. Doug. It's also interesting to note the Bible in Revelation tells us that the devil and his angels are cast into the lake of fire. So it's not the devil in charge of hell, but it's the devil that gets thrown into the fires of hell and the devil is consumed. The Bible says he shall be no more. So even the devil is destroyed by the fires of hell. Babylon's called uh, confusion. Now wouldn't it be confusing to have a person go right to hell and yet the judgment's still in the future? Why would you punish them before they're judged? Pull them out, then put, judge them, then put them back in? I mean, that doesn't make sense. Uh, confessing your sins to a priest. If you're in a church that says to find forgiveness, you must confess your sins to a priest, where does it say that in the Bible? Now it does say confess your faults to one another, not priests, and pray for one another. It doesn't say you have to confess your sins to a priest. This inside knowledge has been used by church leaders to manipulate people. It's been used as a power to uh, control. Uh, the Bible says you can go directly to the throne of grace through Jesus as your high priest. You do not need to go through an earthly man or woman to confess your sins. Jesus says counterfeit baptisms. The Bible says there's one baptism baptism by immersion and that needs to occur when a person is old enough to make a decision to follow Jesus. Christ was baptized at 30 years of age. People making a decision to follow Jesus are baptized by immersion. The Bible does not talk about infant baptism. It talks about dedicating your child or your baby but it's not even about baptizing them. That's right. And uh, another con characteristic of ancient Babylon God confused their languages, a confusion of tongues. Do we see in some of the charismatic Protestant and Catholic churches services where people are babbling and you don't know what they're saying and they'll confess they don't know what they're saying. And you don't find this happening in the Bible. When the Holy Spirit was poured out and they received the gift of tongues in the Bible, they were speaking in a language that others present understood and they knew what they were saying. They were communicating the gospel. Jesus said in Mark 16, you will speak with other tongues. It is not the kind of a paganistic uh, ecstatic utterances that is now going through a number of Protestant churches and Catholic churches. Um, if you're in a church where they're babbling and no one knows what they're saying, you're in Babylon. So there are some, you know, I, I just dropped that in there to remind me 
There's some notes here I thought I'd read to you as we summarize the teachings of Babylon. There's a number of contradictions between pr the Protestant view of Scripture and the Catholic view. Let me go through this real quick with you. First of all, the Bible teaches we're not to bow down to statues. Is that clear? Exodus 20. Catholic Church says that we should bow down. Uh, the Bible teaches that all have sinned except Jesus. Romans 3, Hebrews 4, 15. The Catholic Church teaches Mary was sinless. The Bible says that Jesus is the only mediator between God and man. 1 Timothy 2, 5. The Roman Catholic Church says that Mary is a co-mediator. The Bible teaches that Christ offered his sacrifice on the cross once for all. Hebrews 7, 27. Hebrews 10, 10. Catholic Church teaches the priest sacrifices Christ over and over on the altar during the Mass. The Bible teaches that all Christians are saints and priests. Ephesians 1, uh, 1 Peter 2, 9. The Roman Catholic Church says that saints and priests are a special caste within Christianity. The Bible teaches that Christians can know that they have eternal life. Uh, 1 John 5, 13. Catholic Church says that Christians cannot and should not know that they have eternal life. The Bible teaches that we should call no religious leader our father. Matthew 23, 9. Catholic Church, of course, calls the priest father and the pope. The Bible teaches not to pray in vain repetition. Matthew chapter 6, verse 7. The Catholic Church says that you can say the Hail Mary or the Lord's Prayer over and over in repetition. The Bible teaches to confess your sins to God only for sin. Isaiah 43, 25. Luke 5, 24. Catholic Church says you confess them to a priest. We just talked about that. The Bible teaches that before baptism, a person should be taught the gospel and the commandments of Christ and believe and repent. And Matthew 28 and Acts 8 and Acts 2. The Catholic Church says little infants should be, must be baptized or they can't be saved. They'll be consigned to hell if they die and they're not baptized. The teaching of purgatory, limbo, prayers for the dead are nowhere in Scripture, but they're relics of paganism. The words of Jesus to the Pharisees apply well when you nullify the word of God in place for man-made tradition. This is what happened with the growth of this harlot in Revelation 17. Go ahead. Question number eight says, what is the second angel's message in Revelation chapter 14? And we studied the three angels' message earlier. Revelation 14, 8 says, and there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen that great city because she made all nations drink the wine of the wrath of a fornication. So one of God's last warning messages that go out to all the world just before the second coming of Christ is a warning of this religious system that is fallen from the truth of God's word. Notice it's not only the mother that's fallen but it's those daughter churches that are holding to these false teachings as we just mentioned. They're part of Babylon in the last days and God is calling his people to come out of this religious confusion. And he doesn't just call them to come out and hover. He calls them to come out of the false into the true. Jesus said, many sheep I have, John chapter 10, which are not of this fold. Them I also must call. They will hear my voice and there will be one fold and one shepherd. So in the last days, obviously there's going to be two groups in the last days. One's got the mark of the beast. One has the seal of God. There'll be a shaking in the last days. People are going to be polarizing into one of two movements. That's happening in the world today. People are being called back to a biblical Christianity. We believe the remnant church has this message to call people out of Babylon into the remnant church and um, based on the truth. Now next section in the lesson, this is very interesting, is in dealing with the seven heads of the beast. What do they represent? Well, go ahead. For one Verse thing. Verse 9 tells us, gives us a clue. It says, she sits upon seven mountains. So the seven heads represent seven mountains upon which the woman or the church sits or is located. Uh, Rome, I want to hear you, you read see, these Italian I, I wasn't going to read all of them. I was going to um, pass it on to you to read. <laughs> 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 but you can see here on the note, it says Rome was founded in 553 B.C. And it's known as the city of seven hills. You know, Pastor Doug, a few years ago, I had the opportunity to actually go visit the papacy. And I was there in the Vatican. We went up onto the roof of St. Peter's Basilica. And we had a tour guide that was there with us, and he was very excited to show us the seven hills. You could see it from the roof upon which Rome is built. Of yeah. course, he wasn't aware of this passage, but I got to think of this verse when he was pointing out these seven heads or seven hills. And, you know, to this day, if you just were to Google city of seven hills, it would say Rome is known of that. Um, 
Now, in your lesson, you're going to find, you know, we looked this up. Our church says there may be five or six potential valid understandings of what the seven heads represent as kings or kingdoms. First, the angel says, everyone's agreed, she sits on a city of seven hills. That's Rome, hills. But the hills have a secondary meaning as kings. And it goes on to say, five are fallen, one is, one is not yet to come. Here's where you're going to see a lot of difference. In your lesson, for instance, it says that you start with Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece. Then the one that is is pagan Rome. One is not yet is papal Rome. Well, Pastor Ross pointed out that one problem with that is that it says that he must continue a short time, speaking of papal Rome. Well, that one, papal Rome lasted the longest. And so I think you said the way you typically teach it is Assyria, the five that are fallen, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and pagan Rome. Because John is looking back from the woman when she's established pagan Rome's in the background. And then you've got one is, papal Rome was in power at that time, one is not yet to come, the United States, which is the second beast of Revelation 13. By the way, that's our free lesson today. And it's interesting to note, we're talking about the one that is not yet come, it says, shall continue a short space. All these powers are described as being persecuting powers against God's people. According to Revelation chapter 13, the second beast, the lamb-like beast, uh, representing the United States, does at the very end of time persecute those who are holding to the truths of Scripture. So it continues a short space. Of course, that's a whole other study, and you might want to go back and take a look at our study on Revelation chapter 13 about the U.S. in Bible prophecy. Yeah. Now, I just threw this in because there's a spiritual analogy in the Old Testament. When it talks about these seven kingdoms that are obstacles to God's people, don't forget when the children of Israel entered the promised land, there were seven kingdoms that tried to keep them out. Remember that? That's mentioned not only in Deuteronomy, but even Stephen's or Paul's sermon in Acts 13. When he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan. Now, when they came into the promised land, it says there were seven nations. When Abraham was there, there were ten nations. So it talks about the judgment then that falls on Babylon, which is our next section. If you look in Isaiah 13, verse 19, Babylon, the glory of the kingdoms, the splendor and pomp of the Chaldeans will be like when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. When he overthrew them, they never came back again. And the fall of Babylon in the last days in Revelation chapter 17 and 18, there's no recovery from that fall. And do you just, uh, I thought I'd just throw this in here. You notice that it says there's seven heads, ten horns. I told you these kingdoms that were adversaries to God's people. You had seven kingdoms and in Abraham's day it's ten kingdoms. Here you find it. On the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram saying to your descendants I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river Euphrates. The Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Kadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, the Jebusites. You all try and do that. Ten nations. And so when you see the seven and the ten that were kind of opposing or blocking God's people to the promised land. That's being repeated in Revelation. All right, in Revelation 17, 16, you want to read? It says, Then he said unto me, The ten horns which you saw in the beast, these will hate the harlot, make her desolate and naked, and eat her flesh and burn her with fire. So we're talking about the destruction of this power Babylon. Revelation describes that there will be a time where the nations that once supported her will turn against her and actually bring about her destruction. Yeah, now, you know, I think we're running out of time to go into uh, three frogs. We actually covered this a couple of weeks ago, so this would be a repeat. Uh, ultimately, three powers will unite the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet in the last days that uh, will become a persecuting power. They go to the kings of the earth and help try and form this confederacy, this beast power confederacy to persecute the people of God. Well, the bottom line is, uh, yeah, they're going to organize. Oh, I don't have time to read all this. We're out of time. <laughs> but uh, how do we stay safe in the last days? It says in Isaiah chapter 8, according to the law, according to the uh, testimony and the law, if they speak not according to this word, there is no light in them. Mm -hmm. And so as long as we're basing our teachings on the Bible, we're safe. Don't have to be confused with the wine of Babylon. Amen? And we have a free offer we want to remind people. We do. Our study guide today is called the U.S. in Bible Prophecy. For those of you who are 
uh, joining us online. If you'd like to receive a free copy <coughs> of our offer, all you'll need to do is call the number 866-788-3966, and you can ask for offer number 181, or you can text the code SH093 to the number 40544, and we'll be happy to send you a copy of the United States in Bible Prophecy. Did you want to say something about this next quarter yeah, that we have? Yeah, this is our second to last study in Revelation. We've enjoyed this, amen? Mm -hmm. And uh, we're going to enter on a new quarterly talking about family seasons, be talking about the Christian family. Very, very important. And uh, Pastor Ross and I both said, I don't know if I'm qualified <laughs> <laughs> to teach this, but we're going to be teaching about the Christian family. And uh, you can get your quarterlies at your church. You know, one more thing I wanted to mention before we close. We've been talking about Revelation 17. Amazing Facts has a study guide written by Joe Cruz uh, that you can download for free. You can read it for free online. It's called The Beast, the Dragon, and the Woman. It outlines a lot of the material we just shared with you. If you go to the Amazing Facts website, you can uh, find that for free. The Beast, the Dragon, and the Woman. And that'll give you a lot more specific information. Thank you very much for studying with us. And God bless you. We'll study His Word together again, God willing, next week. Don't forget to request today's life-changing free resource. Not only can you receive this free gift in the mail, you can download a digital copy straight to your computer or mobile device. To get your digital copy of today's free gift, simply text the keyword on your screen to 40544 or visit the web address shown on your screen. And be sure to select the digital download option on the request page. It's now easier than ever for you to study God's Word with amazing facts wherever and whenever you want and most important, to share it with others. On several occasions, scientists have demonstrated that people, and even creatures, can struggle with depression when exposed to continual darkness. This can be seen every year in the winter months in the Arctic regions. The beautiful village of Ryukan, Norway is situated in a deep valley where mountains block the sun's rays for about six months every year. This, of course, keeps the 3,400 residents in a state of shade and sometimes depressing darkness throughout the winter. Then the town leaders got a bright idea to help illuminate their village during the murky months. In October 2013, Ryukan installed an array of three gigantic 550 square foot mirrors on a nearby mountain a thousand feet above the town. The computer control and solar powered mirrors track the sun through the winter months and reflect a giant beam of sunshine down to the town square, brightening their lives. If you visit Ryukan in the winter months today, you can often see the people gathered or sitting on benches around the town square, bathing in the reflected sunshine. Like those mirrors on the mountain, the Bible says that Christians are to reflect the light of Jesus, who is the light of the world, into this dark planet. Matthew 5.14 says, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do we light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it illuminates everybody in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So friends, use today to brighten the life of someone else by reflecting Jesus. Did you know Amazing Facts has a free Bible school that you can do from the comfort of your own home? It includes 27 beautifully illustrated study lessons to aid in your study of God's Word. Sign up today for this free Bible study course by calling 1-844-215-7000. That's 1-844-215-7000. Amazing Facts change lives. I met my ex-wife and her family were real big into drugs and it started out with them wanting me to go to the doctor to help get them drugs. And you know, I'm, I'm noticing they're going to the doctor, they're coming back with like 60 pills and they're selling these pills for like a thousand bucks. And I'm thinking, wow, this is a lot of money I'm giving these people, so I'm just going to start selling it myself. The problem with that was 
Uh, we had all this money, but we was absolutely miserable. Uh, she would go out and sleep with other guys to get drugs, and that ended my marriage. But during this time, I have to get a job to build back up to where I was at to open my shop again. So I get a job at Food City, and when I get this job at Food City, there's my wife now, Rebecca. She's a cashier there. And when I walk in, she's the most beautiful girl I've ever seen in my life. I, I was like, man, I could never have a girl like that. Wow, she's so beautiful. But as I'm working with her, uh, she's actually kind of mean to me. And uh, she's saying, I don't want anything to do with you. Get away from me, stuff like that. But, you know, I just keep being nice to her and uh, keep trying to give her my phone number. And it's around Christmas Eve. We'd just been dating for a little while and moved in together. My ex-wife shows up with my three children that I had by her. And she's like, here's your kids. Here's their birth certificates. Here's their social security cards. I'm done. And we're starting a family. We have already have three kids. During this time, we spent the next year watching nothing but amazing facts on YouTube. I didn't even know they even had a website at this time. I just knew that this little guy on YouTube was super smart, was teaching Bible, and I wanted to follow him. I wanted to be a Christian. I gave my life to God now because of these truths that I'm learning from Doug Batchelor. Just because Doug taught it didn't make me real sure about going to this church. I, I really didn't want anything to do with it, but I'm, I call the guy up and I'm telling him, and I'm not very nice about it actually. I'm telling him, look, uh, we was thinking about coming to your church and he's really nice and he's like, well, you're more than welcome to, we'd like to have you come. And I'm like, well, hold on, I'm gonna lay down some ground rules. I'm telling him, I said, look here, I'm covered in tattoos and I'm a tattoo artist. And he don't say, well, you know, wow, I didn't know all that, don't come to my church. He says, you're more than welcome, we would love to have you please come he asked me what i want to do and i said well i want to preach i said i have all these truths i have all this knowledge stuff i'd never known before stuff if i'd have had when i was younger that would have been life changing to me i said i got to share this with the world i said i want to preach i want to teach he gives me the book says study that well now that i'm a bible worker i'm able to go reach people that most of the normal churches wouldn't even bother to even speak to. I'm able to go out and reach the people who have lived the life that I've lived. I'm able to let them know that I am like you. I've been there, I've done that. I wanna show you what my life is like now. I wanna teach you this Bible. I wanna show you what Jesus can do for you. It's not too late.